Introduction There are times in certain people's lives when they feel that all their certainties are wavering, all their lights dimming, all the voices of their passions and affection falling silent, including everything that enlivens and moves their being. Thus, being led back to his own center, the individual confronts the problem of all problems. What am I? Then, in almost every case, he begins to see that everything he does, not only in his ordinary life, but also in the domain of higher values, only acts as a distraction, creating the illusion of a purpose and a reason, or something that allows him not to think deeply and to go on living. Daily routines, moral codes, faiths and philosophies, intoxication of the senses, and even disciplines appear to have been created or pursued by people in order to hide from their inner darkness, to escape the anguish of the vast fundamental solitude, and to elude the problem of the self. In some cases, such a crisis can have a fatal outcome. In other cases, one reacts and shakes it off. The impulse of an animal energy that does not want to die reasserts itself, inhibits that which has been briefly intuited through such experiences, and makes one believe that it was just a nightmare a momentary weakness of the mind, or a nervous imbalance. Then, new adjustments are made in order to return to reality. Then there are the evaders. Being unable to grasp it as a whole, they turn the existential problem into a mere philosophical problem, and the game resumes. A new truth, a new system arise. They claim to see the light shining in the darkness, thus refueling the will to go on. Another equivalent solution is the passive reliance on traditional structures and on dogmatic and stereotypical forms of authority. However, there are those who can hold their ground. Something new and irrevocable has occurred in their lives. They are determined to break out of the circle that has trapped them. They abandon all faiths and renounce all hopes. They intend to dissipate the fog and to blaze a trail. What they seek is self-knowledge and the knowledge of being within themselves. For them, there is no turning back. This is one of the ways in which, especially in the modern age, some people may approach the disciplines usually referred to as initiatic. Others are brought to the same point by a kind of recollection and natural dignity, causing the clear sensation that this world is not the true world, that there is something higher than this perception of the senses, and that which is merely human in origin. Some people yearn for the direct vision of reality as if in a complete awakening. In both cases, a person realizes that he is not alone. He will feel close to others who have arrived at this point by another path, or who maybe have always been there. Then, they will learn their truth. Beyond the reasoning intellect, beyond beliefs and what passes today for science and culture, there is a higher knowledge. There, the anguish of the individual ceases. The darkness and the contingency of the human condition dissolve and the problem of being is resolved. This knowledge is transcendent, also in the sense that it presupposes a change of state. It can be achieved only by transforming one's way of being into a new one, changing one's consciousness. Just as it is absurd for a person holding a burning coal to expect that the pain will cease before he drops the coal, likewise it is absurd to think that one can open a path beyond the fundamental darkness of existence while the individual remains what he is. To transform oneself, this is the necessary premise of higher knowledge. Such knowledge does not know problems, but only tasks and realizations. Such realizations must be understood as something entirely positive. The necessary presupposition here is the ability to consider only the concrete, real, naked relationship with one's self and with the world. Especially in the case of modern man, this consists of the conditioned, extrinsic, and contingent relationship characteristic of the physical state of existence. As for the varieties of what has been called the spirit, they are a mere counterpart of physical existence, such that all of their values, good and evil, true and false, superior and inferior, do not constitute a gap in relation to what the self is, as a human being, in the hierarchy of beings. This is why a crisis or a radical upheaval is necessary. This is why it is necessary to have the courage to set everything aside and to become detached from everything. 
the mutation of one's deepest structure is the only thing that matters for the purposes of higher knowledge. This knowledge, which is at the same time wisdom and power, is essentially non-human. It can be achieved by following a way that presupposes the active and effective overcoming of the human condition. Having long been trapped in a sort of magical circle, modern man knows almost nothing of such horizons. Moreover, as Joseph de Mestre correctly pointed out, those who are called scientists today have hatched a real conspiracy. They have made science their monopoly and absolutely do not want anyone to know more than they do or in a different manner than they do. However, this does not mean that this different and higher knowledge does not really exist. The teaching we are concerned with has a much better claim than the predominant religion in the West to say, Quod ubique, quod ab omnibus, et quod semper. That which is everywhere from all things and forever. This teaching corresponds to a unitary tradition that can be found variously expressed in the traditions of every people, sometimes expressed as the wisdom of ancient royal or priestly elites, sometimes as knowledge concealed in sacred symbols, myths, and rituals, whose origins are lost in primordial times, or as allegorical writings, mysteries, and initiations, or as theurgy, yoga, or high magic, or, in more recent times, as the secret knowledge of underground currents that surface here and there in the course of Western history, up to the Hermeticists and the Rosicrucians. This path also corresponds to a precise, rigorous, methodical science, transmitted from flame to flame, from initiate to initiate, in unbroken chains that are rarely evident to the profane. This science has nothing to do with external things and phenomena, but it focuses on the deepest energies of human interiority, and proceeds experimentally, with the same criteria of objectivity and impersonality as in the exact sciences. This science, just like modern scientific disciplines, basically predicts the same effects in the presence of the same conditions and the same operations independent of feelings, morality, and abstract speculation. This divine technique, traditional in the higher sense of the word, affords real possibilities to those who, after the previously mentioned crisis, find in themselves the strength and calmness to overcome it in a positive manner and to experience it as a catharsis and purification from everything that is merely human. Moreover, this science offers real possibilities to another category of beings, namely those few individuals in whom, in mysterious ways, an ancient legacy re-emerges and grows again, almost like the instinct of another race that has disappeared in the course of the millennia. The human brain has already given all it had to offer. Now what matters is to make the whole body into an instrument of consciousness, which, by overcoming the limitation of the individual, must penetrate those vital layers where the dark and deep energies of a higher self are at work. Until the entrance of the path leading to the closed palace of the king is found again. This collection of essays aims at presenting clues, suggestions, and techniques of this secret science, which, in its essence, is not transmitted in a body of beliefs and concepts, but rather becomes a light of inner awakening, shining from spirit to spirit. We have tried, as a general criterion, to avoid as much as possible any discussion about things, and to capture instead their essence, omitting nothing in order to be fully understood. Wherever obscurities remain, this is not by our wish, but due to the nature of the subject matter itself. Higher knowledge is first and foremost experience, but everything that is experience is intelligible only through an analogous experience. Any written or printed communication will always meet a limit that can be removed only by one who can take up the position corresponding to the particular teaching. We will limit our subject matter to 1. Exposition of methods, disciplines, and techniques. 2. Reports of real, historical, initiatic experiences. 3. Republication or translation of rare or little-known texts, or excerpts, from both Eastern and Western traditions. When necessary, these will be clarified, annotated, and presented so as to awaken inner energies and to disclose new perspectives. 4. Recognize doctrines placed in appropriate context, intended to challenge the rigidified view of man, the world, and history that has prevailed since the advent of modern civilization. The various essays in this book complement one another. Overall, they are arranged in such a way that all the elements necessary for an adequate comprehension of each one have already been given, 
to a large degree, the contributors have played the role of organic parts joined in one common task by taking up, integrating, and developing in a new light what the others have said. By following a practice found in ancient India and in Western medieval schools, among the Pythagoreans and the Hermeticists, in the medieval initiatic guilds, among the Rosicrucians, and some monastic authors, and partly even in the Jesuits, we have adopted the principle of anonymity. We have chosen to do so because it is not the personality of the contributor that matters, since anything meaningful and valid he has to make is not his creation or discovery, but rather reflects a super-individual and objective teaching. The editors have tried as far as possible to prevent these essays from echoing the particular currents with which their various authors were more familiar, so that the expositions may focus on the constants that are found in every authentic initiatic discipline. The largest concession we have to make is the use of the word magic in the title. Rather than referring to what that word meant in antiquity, in this context, magic assumes a metaphorical sense characterizing only a particularly active assumption of traditional and initiatic disciplines that is more or less shared by the whole group of contributors. The contributors also share in their opposition to the varieties of what today goes by the name spiritualism, ranging from vulgar seances to Anglo-Indian theosophy, occultism, anthroposophy, and other similar trends. We regard them all as deviations having nothing to do with authentic traditional initiatic teaching. They are indeed a hybrid mixture of fragments of ancient truths, modern mental distortions, visionary currents, and second-rate philosophy dressed up with a moralistic and evolutionary humanitarian sauce. The editors of this book have taken great care to convey to the reader a sense of detachment from these confused and counterfeit forms that mirror only the decadence and lack of principles in our times. The reader of this work will not easily find elsewhere such a wealth of specialized teachings, presented with precision and clarity. He will have to decide how far to limit himself to a simple reading for information's sake, and how far, discovering a higher vocation previously only dimly sensed, he wants to dare, to work, and to be silent. According to an initiatic teaching, those who strive with an inner and fervent seriousness will rarely be left alone. It is possible that for some, this contact with Ur will be only the first, to be followed by others at the proper time, in virtue of an inescapable law. Those who, having left one shore behind, and still struggling in the waters, are already striving to reach the other shore.